Sit down, sit down. Man, oh, you're okay, dude. You just got a ricochet in your head. Where, where's your helmet, dude? You didn't wear it because you, you've never trained in it and you got a headache and you took it off? What? Helmets have come a long way and more and more people are starting to wear them. But you know what? I see a lot more people focusing on plate carriers and what armor is best and which plate carrier is best. And very few people are arguing about which helmet is best. Because I'm going to tell you one thing, guys. As much air as your lungs can take in, as hard as your heart can beat, if there's no brain because your brain has been removed from your body, you're going to be in the big sky and it won't matter at all. So today, we're going to be talking about helmets. This is going to be the first in a series of Becoming Deadly with your gear. Now, before we get into it, we of course have to thank the biggest sponsor of the channel, and that is the Sonoran Desert Institute. A big thank you to them if you're looking to get your start into gunsmithing. They are a great resource. We can't thank them enough for sponsoring this channel. And we of course have to thank the sponsors for this particular video, Zydex Computers. A big thank you to them, uh, our gaming channel. It's getting started, which brings us to Patreon. Patreon. I'm not gonna forget the Patreon, man. Get into the Patreon, uh, Micah. It's bussin'. It's bussin', dude. There's it's no other way to describe it. <laughs> it has all the content I don't want you to see. I answer questions. Micah posts just stuff that's not good. And uh, it's fun. It's it's a good time. So go and check it out. Also, uh, hey, where'd you get that hat? Well, check out the Patreon. <laughs> Find out. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, my often forgotten, but most certainly not by me, Bump Helmets. Welcome to the channel. So to start off, we have to ask our question which type of helmet do you need? And that's a good question. It actually comes down to what type of protection do you need? So right here, we have my tried and true OpsCore Maritime slash OpsCore SF. We'll talk to that. We have an OpsCore RF, and in its own category, we have a bump helmet. Now, I want to point out right now that we recommend OpsCore helmets. It is what is best, pound for pound, protection for protection. But it should be noted, there's a lot of really good companies out there, such as Team Wendy, such as Mtech, and of course, Gentex, which is the parent company to OpsCore using slightly older technology. But to get back into it, with our Maritime right here, this is your typical frag protection. These aren't specifically rated to stop rifle rounds. However, there have been multiple, multiple instances where they have done so. So you have to understand that these offer a lot of protection. A lot of people will say, why do I need a helmet? Because if I get shot in the head, I'm dead anyhow. Not so much the case, my friend. I would highly recommend at the very least having the protection that is offered by the Maritime slash SF system. Now what's great about it is it offers all of your classic protection at a really good weight. Moving over, we have the OpsCore XR. This is one of the newer designs that they have, and what is incredible about this is we have a 2.8 pound helmet, so very little weight increase over the SF. Now, compared to the SF, we have the ability to stop 7.62 by 3.9 lead core rounds. Now, beyond that, we do have another helmet, the RF1. That will stop your common round, so 7.62, not the lead core, but the bad stuff, and it does an incredible job at that. However, with the RF1, we're looking at 3.5 pounds. So we're going up in weight as we go up in protection class. The question is, what's gonna work for you? Hey, if you're a SWAT guy and you got your helmet on for all of 40 minutes for your raid, that RF1 is probably gonna be awesome for you. Maximum protection, which is important. But if you're hiking around the mountains all day, you might wanna sacrifice a little bit of that protection for something that's a little bit more lightweight because your neck can only take so much, which brings me to our bump helmets right here. So with our bumps, a lot of people get this confused. They say, if I am going to buy a bump, which is much less expensive than these guys, which are anywhere from two to $3,000, I know, expensive. They say, if I'm gonna buy something as cheap as a bump, why not buy a Chinese helmet, which gives me ballistic protection? But you're misunderstanding the purpose of the bump helmet. What's great about the bump helmet is for my military guys out there, uh, especially my army guys, I don't know why, but you guys are just chewed up by the army and spit out. You probably have herniations in your neck. Every guy who's worn night vision, worn helmets professionally has it. And that's gonna be really tough on you. So what's nice about the carbon, is it's very lightweight, so I can still have the night vision, the comms, I can do all of the training that I need to do with a traditional helmet, but with much less weight without putting that additional strain on my neck, because no matter what, 
those injuries aren't going away. So try to take care of yourself as much as possible. And that is why at different times I will use a bump helmet. All right, Micah, come on over here. So there's a lot of questions about the cut of the helmet. A lot of people see the high cut and they say, why would I sacrifice this uh, with the possibility of taking a round through there where traditionally it's been covered by older helmet designs such as the older Mitch system, which is still a really good system. Well, it depends on what you need. So comms to me are incredibly important um, for whatever situation you might find yourself in. So to me, having the comms capability is much more important than having that little bit of extra protection that we have there. I will take the comfort, which we'll talk about later, of having this system in place. Now, for those of you who believe that the op score is overall sacrifice, it is not. Because if you look at the back, the op score has excellent back protection as well as front, front protection. So it is a very well-shaped shell. And from many studies, people will typically tell you that most of the fragger impacts are coming from the back or from the front, and there's a smaller likelihood. But no matter what, Everything is going to be a sacrifice. Everything is a trade-off. There is no free lunch. So we know what type of helmet that we need based on what we do. Now the question is, what are we gonna have on your helmet? And I can't stress this enough. Every ounce that you add to your helmet is a potential liability. You need to be so deliberate with what you're putting on your helmet because I've seen a lot of crazy shit on helmets recently. So you have to understand every ounce that we add on there when we receive an impact or a head, whether it be from shrapnel, uh, bumping something, whatever, that force, that weight from that helmet is going to your poor, delicate little spine. So as much as you work out, as hard as you make your neck, it, it, it's still a very weak part of the body. You need, to, you need to make sure that you're taking care of it. So when we're talking about things that we need to have on our helmets, there's a couple things that are needed. In no particular order, we have camouflage, we have comms, we have night vision, we have battery packs and counterweights, we have lights, maybe, and strobes. So we're gonna talk about all of that as well as suspension systems as we get into this. Camouflage. So somewhere out there, somebody's gonna kill me for this one. There is a salty special operations guy that has had his maritime for 8,000 years. That's approximately how long they've been serving and their maritime has been worn shiny. Because you see, when your Opscore helmet shows up, it's got a nice camouflage paint in it that breaks up light. However, as it gets worn in, it begins to wear off and you get that shine back to it. As cool as that is, as much of a vibe as that is and a sign of saltiness, um, it could possibly give away your position. So when it comes to camouflage and helmets, this is something that's become more of a I guess topic as we've gone from insurgency fighting to possibility of something else. So in general, at the very least, I do recommend a helmet cover. So the helmet cover that I typically use is this cover from ODG. As you can see, what's nice about them is it does allow points to retain wires. So I use it to retain my battery pack wires as well as retention, whether it be for your strobe or for your battery packs. Um, they are typically well done. So I very much so like the ODG cover. But to be clear, the Opscore cover, which is this one right here, is also awesome. So this one is actually screwed in through the mount and then is Velcroed on. Um, this is also a very good design as well. The point is, is you need to have some type of camouflage. So one thing that I've been really liking are these helmet covers from Low Pro Apparel. These things are pretty awesome. They add a lot of depth, a lot of camouflage to your helmet, and I think are a really good option. The point is, Camouflage your helmet, get into that field craft, that is going to matter. So make sure that you do some amount of camouflage, at least to kill any type of shine or anything like that when it comes to your helmets. So comms, there are a lot of really good headsets out there. And I really have to take a moment to thank a lot of the people that I've talked to in coming up with these videos. You have to understand that my knowledge is always gonna be limited. I have my experiences. So we have to, of course, thank Sam Houston from Silent Solutions and of course, Chip Lasky and the many other um, active duty special operations guys that we can't talk about because they're still active duty. But in any case, coming up here, my main bay are running Pelter Comtac 6s. Um, with the 6s, they are really awesome because what they do have is a nib system. It is a wireless system that when you have other headsets that are configured properly that are, that are within about eight feet of you, 
and there's gunfire or there's something like that where it's too loud to the point where you can't be heard, it will actually transmit your voice and detect those levels and cancel out everything else. So that is a really cool thing about the Pelters. And another thing that I really like about the Pelters is my ability to passively cool. So if you come in right here, these mounts from 3M, as you can see here, get onto the arc rails right there. And when you use them, you pop them in and they put pressure against your helmet. So if we show that right here, so you can see when I actually need to pop them down and get good hearing protection, I can simply push those down. Now, when I need to cool off my ears, I can pop them out. However, when they are popped out, you will notice that I can still hear comms. That is why I really like the 3M system quite a bit. Now, there are, of course, a lot of problems with contacts or problems with the mounts, but there are certainly some good things about them. Now, if we compare that to another really good headset, this one from OpsCore, you can see right here that it is mounting in a completely different fashion. So with this one right here, we have these arms that swing from the back. Now, what's really nice about these is that, first off, it puts the weight further back. So typically, especially when you have a night vision system on that adds a little bit more weight to the system and that allows me to not have to put as much weight in my counterweight system and it is much welcome. Now besides that, this is probably the most comfortable system of any of the con systems. So if I put this guy on, that is super comfy and just wonderful. Now the problem being, if I need to cool off my ears, my comms are all the way out. Dumbo coming in for landing. So typically you bring them up and you fold them back, but no matter what, it just, it's not the best. So the problem being, of course, as you can see, that I don't have a good way to passively cool my ears off, which is really annoying for me because if you've been in the military, you know that a lot of military stuff or a lot of tactical stuff, or if we're talking like real deal, uh, you know, 1%, maybe probably way less of combat, but a lot of it is moving around, talking to your boys and stuff. So being able to passively cool off your ears as you're moving around with pelters is wonderful. Now, if you really want to anger somebody or go full unholy union, we have what I call the 3M amps. So in this case, I have bastardized a 3M pelter mount. I have shoved it into an ops core mount, and then I have mounted it to my helmet. I wanna thank the Rangers for showing me how to do this. Um, you guys are always just making things horrible. So this is wonderful because I do consider the ops core amps to be a better headset than the Pelters overall. And this gives me all the benefits. I can pop them out. And it gives me the added benefit of uh, giving people cancer probably because it's so ugly. But real talk guys, what's going to be important with your helmets if you notice right here is going to be routing of your wires. So if you come and take a look at how I have my pelters routed, you'll notice that these wires that connect the two systems together is routed internally through my pads. So that way it doesn't create any hot spots. I see a lot of guys running these external. You can certainly do that. However, I do believe it creates a snag factor and I do like running them internal if at all possible. Now beyond there, a lot of guys ask, you know, do I need a two down lead, a one down lead? So we see we have two right here. It depends on what you do in your job. Probably a one is going to be more than enough for you. You can see that on these particular ear pro right here. So you can see right here, I have these wires retained. This is from Coffin Works. They do some pretty good stuff. Uh, you can also just take a ranger band up around here and wrap your wires up there. There's a lot of good ways to do it. Point is take care of your wires, get them out of the way. Don't let them dangle. Some different battery packs and different counterweight systems will allow you to put the wires back there. Point is, just get them out of the way. But if there's anything to take away from this talk about comms, it's that you should have them. Great thing about helmets, they are a great platform for night vision. So the suspension system, the Ear Pro, all allows you to keep that night vision very, very stable. So if you'll come up here, the first thing that we have is a G24 mount. There are many different types of mounts available. Now, for a long time, people have said they liked or hated the G24 because the G24 does have a breakaway mount. And the reason for that is if you're fast roping out of a helicopter and your nods get snagged, it doesn't rip your head off. Rather, the mount breaks away. Or if you're wearing 31s and they're just going to break if you look at them. Should just kidding. Full speed through a doorway. <laughs> you, like, clip your nods. Yeah. yeah, you're done, dude, with 31s. They're just, they're just straight broken. But the G24 is like the classic um, military standard issue. Now, there, of course, are, is the G22 
which is a non-breakaway mount, and there are a couple other different mounts out there in general. I'm just gonna tell you guys, G22 or G24, that, that's kind of just the way to go. Unfortunately, they're super expensive. Wilcox has the market cornered. There's not much you can really do about that. Now, with your night vision, there's a couple different things to think about. So if you come in here, a couple things to notice. These are PVS 31 Alphas. Um, I do have two bands on them, as well as this nice little retainer from T-Rex Arms. That's right, we're gonna fight at some point. Not yet, I'll tell you when. But the reason I have those is to retain my night vision because this little mount right here can break and you don't wanna lose these. These are worth a lot of money and you'd be very sad and you'd have to tell your mom where all that money went that you spent her, uh, her credit card money on. But in any case, I like this mount. It allows me to quickly attach my night vision and if I want additional security, on these, I can also attach uh, the retention off my helmet. On newer helmets right here, you can see that the mount actually has the integral uh, attachments right there. So they're a little bit closer to the system, a little bit more out of the way. Now, if you come up right here, you'll see a couple things I've done to stabilize this mount. So to start off with, um, one, this mount can shake a little bit. So I've actually shimmed it with a little bit of tape to make sure it doesn't jiggle or anything like that. Small trick of the trade. Beyond that, I have these bands right here that I wrap up and over the mount. That's just to make sure that it is super stable. It is unfortunately, it does have a little play at times and this kind of just keeps it from moving around so much. So that is typically how I have my night vision set up. Articulation is nice, of course, because you can get it closer to your helmet because the further away from your helmet you get the system, the more weight you're adding. And that will certainly matter when we get into more heavy systems like the GPMVG 18s or some of the older systems like the PVS 15s or Sentinels or anything like that. My camera guy over there yelling about wobble on night vision systems that cost like $500 for a mount. I don't know what to tell you, Micah, they wobble. Shim them with tape. Surefire X300s also wobble on your light and they're like $330, so go yell at Surefire. Now, speaking of weight, we can also move back to battery packs and counterweights. So the question is, why do you need a battery pack when a battery in a 31 or Sentinels or whatever will last eight hours. Well, the reason for that is that they'll last eight hours in good conditions. So where we are right now is it's getting pretty cold. It was actually just raining. As those batteries get cold, they're gonna run a lot less efficiently. I've had uh, PBS 31 Alphas burn through a battery in less than two hours. So having a battery pack to me is pretty essential. Now, what's nice about the battery pack is it does add a little bit of weight, however, it is not enough. And this brings us to the counterweights. For many of you guys, a counterweight system might seem a little counterintuitive because why would I wanna add weight to my helmet when I just yelled at you guys about adding weight to your helmet? Well, the reason is balance. You see, when these guys are all the way down, like I've shown you before, they're very far from your head and that's going to cause some problems. The only way to alleviate that because that is going to begin to cant your helmet forward and that's gonna be very hard on your neck. Um, you're right here is just gonna be screaming if you don't have any counterweight. So we have the counterweight to balance it out to make it a lot easier on you. So in general, I'm typically using the Opscore counterweight. You can see it right here on the back. So all you have to do is you can peel this guy open, excuse me, so you get that guy open and this allows you to add little weights that they have in there and you add the precise amount of weights that you need and then you can balance that system. So these are pretty nice, there are many systems out there we of course have to recommend the really good tnvc mohawk um, developed by those guys over there and they run night vision all day and that is a really good system the point is find a good counterweight system that works for you and use it you will need it even something like pvs 31a some of the lightest night vision devices out there require a little bit of counterweight in reality i've seen a lot of guys muscle through having 31s mounted with no counterweight i know you can do it However, if you're gonna be running this for months on end and you care at all about your neck, you're gonna to wanna to have a little bit more weight on there to ensure that you just don't hate your life in 20 years when you can't move your neck. Quick note. A big shout out to uh, Counting Coop Tactical from Spirit of Systems, rubber band trick. Very good idea. Now, <clears throat> lights are also going to be important in certain situations. Um, this is very dependent. So for what I have done for like reading map work or looking at your right in the rain, which you should have, a small reading light is going to be important. Typically, the most used light is some type of Princeton Tech. We have this one right here. We also have the 
the charge light, which is right here, uses a more common battery, just a double A we got right here. The point is a nice little flexible light is gonna save you a lot of headache because not everything in the tactical world is going to be uh, shooting and killing. A lot of it is figuring stuff out, reading maps, so it's gonna be helpful. I always have some type of headlamp, but you can understand that it's kind of difficult to get a headlamp up when you have a helmet on and you need to keep that helmet on, as a quick note. Beyond these small little lights right here, uh, you will see some people using some type of surefire light, some type of surefire vampire, is usually pointing up or down. The question is, why do people do that? So you have to understand that night vision needs light to work. There are areas, there are situations where there's going to be zero ambient light. Therefore, night vision will not work. So by using a light, especially a vampire light, that means it's putting out IR light that is only detectable by night vision. If you aim that up, that can bounce off a roof, off a ceiling, and that can create a nice umbrella flood in areas where you need artificial IR light for CQB or for post assault work or for SSE, which is sensitive site exploitation. That is basically finding important things on whatever target you just hit. So those 100% have a place um, and you just have to understand on whether or not you need that based off of what you are doing. So if you're gonna be in areas where there is no ambient light, you should probably think about having one of those on your helmet. So this is gonna be super dependent on you, on who you're with and everything, but we have strobes. So right here we have a Hellstar 6. Um, this is your strobe used just all over the world, proven, all that good stuff. So what a strobe does, in case you're not aware, is depending on what setting you have, it'll either be visible or it'll be IR. So we have our visible setting right here, and then if we click it up, we have an IR setting. So there are different things. It can be steady, it can be a strobe. And the question is why? Well, in the military sense, it can be used for many things. It can be used during free fall, so you can know where other guys are. Uh, it can be used for aircraft. Um, in a sense of what we might be using it for, it could be used in emergency situations in something like a pace plan. If you're not familiar with what a pace plan is, it stands for primary alternate contingency emergency. That essentially is setting four different ways of communicating with teammates if one of them fails. So for example, if your primary way of communicating is a radio and that radio fails, what is the plan after that? And in emergency situations, perhaps a strobe could be one of the ways that you're communicating. The point is it is going to be completely dependent on what you do, but understand that it is certainly something that can be added to your helmet that has a lot of benefit in many situations like the ones we just outlined. And it looks freaking cool. So we finish up the main parts of what is important to have on your helmet. There are a couple last things I do want to talk about, which are important. So something like extra face armor, right? Uh, if you want to look like you're the Mandalorian or something like that, very cool first off, but why? Um, this isn't something that you typically see being worn on a ground mission, but rather if you're vehicle mounted and that vehicle's moving you around, and you can have as much protection as needed. So that's where something like this is gonna come into play and these integrate directly into helmets. Uh, m -Tech makes a version of these. Um, they're definitely out there and they definitely do have their place. Another cool thing that I wanna talk about is if you wanna come over here and take a look at it, is what's called this step-in visor. You've probably seen it up to this point. So it's a visor, you can see it has these nice little rubber seals around there. So for guys who are used to those older turbo fans, those older goggles, this kind of is able to replace them and it integrates directly into your helmet. Uh, a lot of good things that I have to say about this. It is a very cool design and then when you don't need it, you can easily just pull it off your helmet. And what's nice about that is I can leave these clips on and they're very unobtrusive. They don't really get in the way, but at the same time, I can keep this in a pocket in my pack and uh, I can put it on when needed. And this is gonna be something that's definitely going to be probably more for vehicle work or for some really intense uh, urban work where there's a lot of dust, grime, or something getting kicked up. There is certainly a purpose to it. So to wrap things up, if there's anything that I can explain to you of everything that we've talked about, the most important thing when it comes to a helmet is going to be wearing it. If your helmet isn't fitted to your head because it's like, a, I think GBRS group said it best, it's like a baseball glove, right? 
These are going to be fitted to your head. Everybody's heads are a little bit different. Everybody's shaped weird. Some guys have a five head. Some guys have a three head. The point is find the pads that put this at the correct orientation on your head and wear it. Actually wear it. Like sit down at your computer when you're, you know, playing uh, ready or not or whatever and wear it for a couple hours. You'll be surprised at the types of results that you get. You'll be like, holy crap, I'm actually starting to get a headache after a couple hours of this thing on. Like, that's kind of concerning. Well, hike with it on. Actually train with it on. I don't know why people wear plate carriers, but then when it comes to helmets, they're like, ooh, that is crossing like the LARPing line. Like there is a cliff and I will not cross that cliff because the helmet is too much. You should be training in helmets. You should be intimately familiar with them. And if you look right here on some of the newer OpsCore linings that we have, they're incredible. They're in both incredibly comfortable. They fit very well. There's a variety of pads to get the correct height. And OpsCore has an entire video about making them fit well, as do many other manufacturers. Find them. I love these because they ventilate my head very well. And by ventilate, I mean not holes in my head, but rather they vent all the sweat off so that I'm not just sweating profusely. So guys, get out there, train in your helmets, find a helmet that is going to work for you, and set it up smart. Be deliberate with what you put on it. But more importantly, like we've always stressed, train in it. If you don't train in it, none of it matters, guys. So get out there and train. I'm not going to say get professional training specifically on this, but you should get out there and use it. Use is what is going to be the difference between being good with the helmet and just having no idea what you're doing. Get out there, use them, be deadly. Guys, thank you so much for watching. We've got nothing else for you. Final thing for you guys, possibly not bulletproof hats, coming out soon. That's what we got for you. Cool. Save up.